the contents of the epistle, of the second epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, analytically expounded. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The second epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, analytically expounded by David Dixon, translated by William Retchford. The contents of the epistle. The first epistle did not want its effect amongst many of the Corinthians, yet there were some, especially vain-talking teachers, who persevered in their contumacy, and not only they themselves set at naught the apostle's authority, but also dared publicly to compare themselves with him, and to prefer themselves before him, and to diminish the authority of the apostle amongst the people, with no small detriment and prejudice to the gospel, that he might restrain these and find all things at his coming better ordered in the church of Corinth, he writ this second epistle, which is wholly apologetical. Besides an exordium and conclusion, there are three parts of the epistle. In the first, having removed the scandal of the cross, which was laid upon him, and the suspicion of his alienated mind from the Corinthians, chapters 1 and 2, he defends his ministries, chapters 2 and 3, and proves his constancy and fidelity therein, chapters 4 and 5, exhorting them to bring forth the fruits of his ministry, chapter 6, and that they would persuade themselves of his good will towards them, chapter 7. In the second part of the epistle, he exhorts them to make a collection for the poor brethren, the afflicted Jews, chapters 8 and 9. In the third part, he vindicates his authority from contempt and the aspersions of false teachers, who laboured to render the apostle vile amongst the Corinthians, chapter 10, and holily boasts himself against them, chapters 11 and 12, endeavouring to render his authority formidable and also amicable to the Corinthians, chapter 13. End of the contents of the epistle. Chapter 1 of the Second Epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, analytically expounded by David Dixon, translated by William Retchford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 1. There are two parts of the chapter, besides the inscription of the epistle. In the former he removes the scandal of the cross and afflictions, wherewith he was not long since oppressed, to verse 12. In the second part he removes the suspicion of an alienated mind from the Corinthians to the end. The inscription of the epistle, which is instead of an exordium, verses 1 and 2, serves to prepare the minds of the Corinthians for receiving the things which he wrote, intimating five reasons to that end. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in Achaia. The first reason, because Paul, the author of the epistle, was an apostle of Jesus Christ, and of chiefest authority in the church. Reason two, because he did not assume to himself this honour, as certain false brethren feigned themselves servants of Christ when they were not sent of God, but obtained it by the special will of God. Reason three, because he had brought in Timothy with himself to witness against them, if they should not admit of this truth of God written by him. Reason four, because what he was about to write appertained not only to the church of Corinth, but to all the saints and churches in all Achaia, to wit, to know this asserted truth which he was about to write. Verse 2. Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father, and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Reason 5. Comprehended in the salutation or apostolical benediction, because Paul, the author of this epistle, would not that the dignity of the church of Corinth should anyways be eclipsed, although he knew there were most corrupt persons among them, not only which lay hid, but openly showed themselves enemy to the apostle, but constantly accounted the church at Corinth a true church, to which, by his authority, he applied the benediction of the gospel, and doubted not to wish them all good things. Therefore they were obliged to receive the things which he wrote, with that submission and readiness of mind that was fitting. The first part. Verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comforts. In the first part of the chapter, the apostle proves that the Corinthians ought not to despise him by reason of the cross or afflictions, and that by twelve arguments. Argument 1. In the midst of afflictions, I find God the Father most merciful and abundant in all consolation, so that I have cause rather to bless God than to complain of my calamities sent of God. Therefore ought you not to contemn me, or to be offended because of my afflictions. Verse 4. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. 
Argument two, by the experience which I have in afflictions, I am made more fit to manifest comfort unto others that are afflicted, therefore ought you not to be offended in me, etc. Verse five, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Argument three, afflictions are a part of martyrdom, and for the gospel, or for Christ, are inflicted upon me with honour, that they may be called the afflictions of Christ by way of participation, for what things are inflicted upon the martyrs, Christ takes upon himself, as Acts 9, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecute me, therefore, etc. In us, argument four, Christ gave testimony, from his superabundant and seasonable consolations towards me, in the midst of my afflictions, that the miseries which I suffer are afflicted upon me for the defence of the gospel, therefore, etc. Verse 6. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Argument 5. Those afflictions, as also these comforts, tended to the benefit of the Corinthians, who might be strengthened in the faith and built up diverse ways to salvation, and to take comfort from the apostles' experience. Therefore ought they not to be offended in the apostles' sufferings, which effectually produceth. Argument 6. Because the salvation of the Corinthians was effectually to be promoted by his suffering such kind of afflictions, by which, as by the way to salvation freely given, they were earnestly to strive, therefore, etc. And the hope. Argument 7. I have certain hope of you that you will not despise us, nor take ill the afflictions which ye shall suffer, therefore ye are bound not to frustrate our hope concerning you. Verse 7. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so shall you be also of the consolation. Argument 8. I know that you are made both partakers of our sufferings by your sympathy, and shall partake of our consolations. Therefore you are bound not to despise us because of the afflictions which we suffer. Verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. Verse 9. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. Verse 10. Who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Argument 9. From his special example and late sufferings in Asia. So far am I from being ashamed of my afflictions, that I am desirous all should understand how great they are, and also my infirmity, that God may be glorified the more. Therefore ought you not to despise me for my afflictions. He shows the greatness of his afflictions, and his own infirmities in this, that in the tumult at Ephesus, whereof he speaks, Acts 19, verse 23, or some such like danger, he knew not which way to turn himself to escape the danger of his life, expecting in himself nothing but certain death that we should not trust. Argument 10. I have learned by this experience and the like not to confide in myself, but in God alone, who can deliver from imminent death those that are ready to die, and raise up them which are dead. To which end God was pleased to bring me into danger, therefore he ought not to despise my affliction. We hope. Argument 11. By this late experience and such like, God hath stirred up in me a firm hope of my deliverance for the future, though I fall into new calamities. Therefore ought you not to despise my affliction. Verse 11. You also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on your behalf. Argument 12. Because the knowledge of his sufferings and his deliverance should stir up the Corinthians, among others, to pray for him, and so to obtain his deliverance for the future, and by consequence also to thanksgiving by many unto God, which argument, being considered, the Corinthians could not despise Paul for the afflictions which he suffered, at least they ought not to be offended in him. The second part. Verse 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world, and more abundantly to you wards. The second part of the chapter follows, wherein he removes their suspicion of his estranged mind from them, which the false apostles, his adversaries, seem to foment with frivolous arguments, and proves that they ought not to surmise any change of his carriage towards them, or that his mind was alienated from them, by six arguments, after which he answers two or three objections, which were brought to the contrary by his adversaries. 
Argument 1, wherein he gives an account why his safety ought to be commended to the mole, and also proves that he continued the same as the Corinthians had found him, in so many months' trial that he had stayed amongst them. In simplicity and godly sincerity, I have always behaved myself so as to approve myself to God, my own, and other men's consciences. Therefore there is no reason that you should suspect any change, either of my carriage or affection towards you. Not with. Argument 2. Hereby he confirms the former. The fountain of my conversation was the grace of God, which is like itself and always constant, not that subtle wisdom whereby carnal men, for their profit's sake, counterfeit respect to others, which indeed they have not. Therefore let no suspicion be amongst you about the change of my carriage and affection towards you. Verse 13. For we write none other things unto you than what you read, or acknowledge, and I trust you shall acknowledge even to the end. He confirms that he had said before, adding a third argument, because his deeds and his writings were answerable to each other, wherein he seems to tax his adversaries who carried themselves otherwise, as in the former argument, which he proves by the testimony of the Corinthians themselves, who, although they were somewhat disturbed by the whisperings of adversaries, yet they acknowledged his sincerity and constancy, and he hoped they would afterwards do the like. Therefore, etc. Verse 14. As also you have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of our Lord Jesus. Argument 4. Because in some measure, although not with that confidence as became them against the false apostles, the Corinthians boasted of their conversion by the apostle, and the apostle boasted of them as the fruit of his apostleship, and further, he hoped to glory in the day of judgment. Therefore, etc. Verse 15. And in this confidence I was minded to come unto you afore, that you might have a second benefit. Verse 16. And to pass by you into Macedonia, and to come again out of Macedonia unto you, and of you to be brought onward my way to Judea. Argument 5. Because he had a purpose to go to the Corinthians in confidence of mutual good will, that he might complete the first benefit of their conversion by confirming their faith as a second benefit, and that he might receive expressions of their good will towards him in the duties which he reckons up to the increase of their mutual love, therefore, etc. Verse 17. When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness, or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? Argument 6. By answering the objection proposed, I have deferred my coming unto you longer than I would, not out of levity of a mind changed, but, as afterwards it shall appear, out of love to you, that I might spare you, who ought to be chastised with the censures of the church, had I come to you before. Therefore, ought you not to suspect the alienation of my mind from you? The objection is propounded in the same terms in which his adversaries did reproach him, as vain and light, speaking like carnal and unregenerate men, and promising what he intended not to perform, as those that slightly promise and easily change their mind, neither whose words, and by consequence, nor doctrine carried any certainty, to whom therefore no credit was to be given. Verse 18. But as God is true, our word towards you was not yea and nay. He answers the objection, and because he is more careful that nothing should be imputed to his doctrine, as also to his credit, he answers first for his doctrine, and confirms the truth thereof by five reasons. Reason 1. Because his doctrine was the word of God, it must of necessity be true, because God is faithful and true, whose dictates and precepts only he taught among them, not sometimes affirming, sometimes denying, as those that are not constant to themselves used to do. Therefore they were to make no doubt of the truth of his doctrine. Verse 19. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. Reason 2. My doctrine and the doctrine of my companions contained nothing but Jesus Christ only, who is the unchangeable Son of God, and the eternal verity always constant to himself. Therefore you are not to make any doubt of my doctrine. Verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him are men, unto the glory of God by us. Reason 3. Confirming the former, all the promises of God in and through Christ are firm, unchangeable, and complete, partly inasmuch as he is the Son of God, by whom all things are made, partly inasmuch as he is mediator, God-man, who completed for us our redemption, and procured it by his merit, that the good things promised might be performed to us, and really he applies them to us. Therefore our preaching, which contains nothing else, is necessarily certain, and no doubt to be made of it. 
to the glory of God, reason four, as the promises of God are yea and amen in Christ, i.e., that is, really and indeed ratified and complete, and so they are acknowledged and preached by us, it makes to the glory of God, who will not have his promises fulfilled but in Christ. Therefore our preaching is so sure and firm, as the purpose of God is in glorifying himself in his Son, neither must you doubt anything in the matter. Verse 21. Now he which establisheth us with you in Christ, and hath anointed us, is God. Verse 22. Who hath also sealed us, and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Reason 5. God is the author of this, our faith in Christ, confirming both the preaching of us, apostles, and the faith of you, Corinthians, as many of you as are sincere, partly by communicating the several gifts of the Spirit, as it were an unction from Christ, partly by setting to his seal to our faith, making us certain of the truth of the gospel, and stirs up ineffable and glorious joy in us, which is, as it were, the earnest of our future happiness, therefore our preaching is sure, nor ought you to make any doubt of it. All these arguments being weighed, upon no ground could the Corinthians suspect that, in the preaching of the apostles, so many ways divinely confirmed, there could be any uncertainty or falsehood, and so he prevents an objection, as it tended to destroy the truth of the gospel. Verse 23. Moreover, I call God for a record upon my soul, that to spare you I came not as yet unto Corinth. He here answers the objection, so far as concerned his credit and carriage, by showing the reason of his not coming unto them, viz., that time of repentance being granted to the Corinthians, he might spare them, i.e. restrain himself from a severe course with them, which at present he was forced to use, and he confirms his word with an oath, because so the gravity of the matter required, therefore not out of any levity did he defer his coming unto them. Verse 24. Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith ye stand. Hence arises another objection. Therefore thou makest thyself lord of our faith, as if thou couldst punish when thou wouldst. He answers by denying any mastery, affirming the power of his ministry, and that to be employed in the benefit of the church, that timely censures, according to the will of Christ, being used, those that repented might at length rejoice. He gives an account why he denied any dominion over their faith because faith is the bond of conjunction with Christ, by which faith we stand fast in the grace of God, in right and title unto Christ, in the possession of things present, and in hopes of future good things. Therefore faith admits no Lord besides God. It admits of men only as ministers and helpers. End of chapter 1《The Second Epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, Analytically Expounded, by David Dixon, Translated by William Retchford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2. There are two parts of this chapter. In the first, he proceeds in his apology for his constant goodwill towards the Corinthians, to verse 14. In the other, he begins his apology for his ministry, to the end. In the first to the former arguments whereby he proved that his mind was not alienated from the corinthians he adds eight signs of his good will towards them verse one but i determined this with myself that i would not come again to you in heaviness sign one that the cause why he changed his purpose concerning his coming to them was lest he should bring sadness to the corinthians at his coming being compelled more severely to correct their manners which he did desire might be amended before his coming verse two for if I make you sorry, who is he then that maketh me glad about the same which is made sorry by me? Sign too, that his sympathy was so much with the Corinthians, that he could not, unless they were glad, rejoice, neither moderate himself from sorrow, so long as any one amongst them by reason of him remains sad. Verse 3. And I wrote this same unto you, lest when I came I should have sorrow of them whom I ought to rejoice, having confidence in you all, that my joy is the joy of you all. Sign 3. That the writing, not only of the former epistle, but also of this second, was undertaken for this end, lest, if he had come to those, and had found them impenitent, besides his sorrow for their sin, he might have been forced to a new sorrow, which necessary severity would create both to them and himself. Having confidence, Sign 4. That he was persuaded that his joy was matter of joy to the Corinthians themselves, and their joys were both to him and them in common. Verse 4. For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote unto you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, 
about that ye might know the love that I have more abundantly unto you. Sign 5. That the former epistle, which necessarily was more sharp, was not writ by him without tears, and truly for that end, that he might testify his ready mind towards them, not that he might make them sorry. Verse 5. But if any have caused grief, he hath not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sign 6. His friendly mind towards the Corinthians, that the apostle did esteem as nothing that heaviness which the incestuous person had created to him, in comparison with that sadness which he had caused to all the Corinthians. He addeth, in part, because his grief was now turned into joy through the incestuous person's repentance. Therefore, by way of mitigation, he saith, that he added, in part, for the incestuous person's sake, now a penitent, lest he should cast a burden on him already burdened in himself, if he should too much aggravate his sin. For six, sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. Sign seven, that now he was ready to receive the penitent, incestuous person into favour, and so to give a proof of his lenity and meekness, that it might appear that the former severity came not but from love and his desire of advantage to the church of Corinth. To which end he declareth that the chastisement of this incestuous person, inflicted by the authority of many, i.e. the governors of the church, the church itself consenting, after his repentance appeared, was sufficient. Verse 7. So that, contrarywise, ye ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such an one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. That he might show his meekness towards the penitent incestuous person, he adviseth that he may by the Corinthian church be again received into favour for these six reasons annexed. Reason one, because they are bound to forgive the penitent and to comfort him, no less than they were bound to excommunicate him being impenitent. Lest perhaps... Reason two, because otherwise it was dangerous, lest he should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow, except they should now receive the penitent into favour again. Verse eight, wherefore I beseech you, that you would confirm your love towards him. Reason three, because, especially they were so desired by the apostle, they are bound to testify their love towards him, to wit by showing themselves to have excommunicated that man, not that they might destroy him, but that by repentance they might save him. Verse nine, for to this end also did I write, that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. Reason four, because by this means they were about to show themselves obedient to the command of the apostle in all things, as before in excommunicating, so now also by absolving him from the bond of excommunication, wherein the apostle did prove their obedience. Verse ten, to whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also, for if I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Verse 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Reason 5, because the apostle, for the sake of the Corinthians, had granted him pardon, and was about to forgive him, therefore it was meet that they, for the apostle's sake, should forgive this man also. Get an advantage. Reason 6, lest, through the craftiness of Satan, the church should suffer harm except now they should forgive him repenting, for by ever much severity sinners may be brought into desperation, or a departing from the church because of Satan, whose arts and deceits to do harm are not unknown to the church. Verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas, to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Verse 13. I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them I went from thence into Macedonia. Sign 8. His constant good will towards the Corinthians, that he could not anywhere rest, also that great hope of promoting the gospel being offered as in Troas, until he had known of Titus, whom he had sent to Corinth concerning their affairs, for the cause of meeting him he went into Macedonia, that by him he might be made more certain concerning the affairs of the Corinthians, and that he might learn whether as yet it was a convenient time to come to the Corinthians. All which signs of his ready mind towards the Corinthians being considered, the apostle persuaded himself that the suspicion that his mind was alienated from them was removed. The second part, verse 14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savour of his knowledge by us in every place. The second part of the chapter follows, in which he defendeth his ministry, and proveth it to be commendable by five arguments, intimating by the way that he whilst he was absent from them, was not idle, but was busied in the work of the Lord with success. 
Argument 1, because Christ in his ministry, and he himself in Christ, did triumph concerning his enemies by snatching many out of the power of Satan and by bringing them to the faith of the gospel. The saver, argument 2, because by his ministry, whatsoever the success were, the sweetness of the gospel and its efficacy was manifested in every place, whilst the knowledge of Christ did breathe a quickening in life, by which sinners are quickened and converted unto God. Verse 15, For we are unto God a sweet savour of Christ in them that are saved, and in them that perish. Verse 16, To the one we are the savour of death unto death, and to the other a savour of life unto life, and who is sufficient for these things. By preventing an objection that the apostles and their preaching would give an ill savour to many, he answereth and adds, argument 3, that notwithstanding the apostles themselves with their ministry were acceptable unto God, and through Christ brought an acceptable savour to God, no less in the conviction and perdition of the reprobates, to which the gospel by accident was a savour of death, than in the faith and salvation of those that believe and are saved, to whom the gospel, both in its own nature and proper effect, was a quickening savour to life and salvation. Who is sufficient? Argument 4. Because seeing that few were fit and sufficient ministers, the interrogation shows whose ministry God might prosper and accept, that he was in the number of those that are made fit for these things which are spoken of, secretly checking the false apostles which were not fit ministers for the conversion of sinners, although they did prefer themselves before the apostles. Verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. He confirms the next argument, more openly noting his enemies and those that envy him, and also adds argument five, from the unlikeness betwixt himself and many preachers, if they did not mix false doctrine, yet they did mingle their own passions with true doctrine, serving their ambition and covetousness, and bending the doctrine to the favour of men. But the apostle, one, in sincerity, i.e. neither mixing false doctrine nor corrupt affections, two, of God, i.e. with confidence and authority, knowing from whence it came, three, in the sight of God, i.e. calling God to witness and looking at his glory, four, in Christ, i.e. he did speak in the virtue of Christ and acknowledgement of his strength, from which it follows that his ministry was commendable and not to be contemned in any wise. End of chapter 2Chapter 3 of the Second Epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, analytically expounded by David Dixon, translated by William Retchford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3. He proceeds to defend his ministry against slanderers. There are two parts of this chapter. In the first, he proveth his ministry to be commendable by five arguments. To verse 6. In the second, he illustrateth and confirmeth the last argument by comparing the legal ministry, or the covenant of works, with the gospel, or the covenant of grace. Verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Argument 1. Of the commendation of his ministry, containing also his clearing himself from the desire of vainglory. The efficacy of my ministry is so apparent to all the churches that I need not any commendatory letters from any particular person, or from you, or from others. Neither do I say these things because I care for vainglory, but that I may defend my ministry against my enemies for your good. Therefore my ministry is commendable. Verse 2. Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Argument 2. Because your conversion, O Corinthians to the profession of the faith by my ministry sufficeth in my conscience and yours for a commendatory epistle, which is understood and acknowledged amongst all. Verse 3, Forasmuch as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Argument 3, By confirmation of the former, because my ministry was effectual not only in bringing you to the profession of the faith, but also to your saving regeneration by the special operation of Christ's Spirit. This is that which he saith, that they were the epistle which Christ himself by his ministry hath written, by writing his will in their hearts by the Holy Ghost, after a more excellent manner than anything was wont to be writ with ink upon paper or tables of stone. Verse 4. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward, Verse 5, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. 
Argument 4. Because he himself, as it becomes a faithful servant, doth not ascribe the whole confidence of glorying to himself, but to his Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God. Which argument he illustrates, partly by confessing his natural impotency to think that which is good, or to the least beginnings of a good work, much less to the converting the Corinthians, partly by acknowledging the grace of God as the fountain of his sufficiency, in that he is fitted to communicate so much grace to others. Verse 6, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Argument 5, because his ministry is the ministry of the New Covenant, not of the law and covenant of works. He confirms this argument with a sevenfold comparison of the ministry of both covenants. The second part, not of the letter. Comparison 1. The ministry of the law or the covenant of works is only the letter written or spoken without efficacy, without all spiritual virtue to perform that which it commands. But the ministry of the gospel or the covenant of grace through Christ is the ministry of the Spirit, because according to and by that the Holy Ghost is administered, whereby the hearer is quickened and strengthened to embrace that which is propounded. Killeth. Comparison 2, confirming the former, the ministry of the law of works, or the written letter, only convinceth of sin, and killeth the sinner, by pronouncing to him the sentence of death. By the ministry of the gospel, or grace in the new covenant, showeth liberty from sin, absolves the sinner, and so brings him life. Verse 7, But if the ministration of death, written and engraven on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. Verse 8, How shall not the ministration of the Spirit rather be glorious? In stones, comparison 3, the law of works, which only administers death, for according to this covenant no man doth obtain righteousness or life, was engraven in stones to signify that the heart by it cannot be mollified or renewed, but remaineth dead. But the gospel of grace is writ in the fleshly tables of the heart, i.e. in hearts, by the power of the Holy Ghost, quickened and mollified. It is so imprinted that the virtue of divine grace may be discerned in all the expressions of the heart. Glorious. Comparison 4. The ministry of the covenant of works, which is the ministry of death to all that have sinned, was truly glorious, as it appeared in Moses, for justice is glorious in punishing of sin. But the ministry of the new covenant, which is the ministry of the spirit quickening, is more glorious, for as in Moses pronouncing the curse of the law against sinners, his bodily glory did shine, but oh, how much spiritual glory doth shine in the face of Christ, setting sinners at liberty by his grace. Verse 9, For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Comparison 4, The ministry of the law, or the old covenant of works, is a ministry of condemnation for sin, therefore indeed glorious, but the ministry of the gospel, or the new covenant, is the ministry of the righteousness of Christ, and absolution from sin, and therefore so much the more glorious, by how much absolution and justification do excel condemnation and sin because by the covenant of works we are all accused of sin, we are all condemned and made obnoxious to death. Therefore its ministry is called the ministry of sin, condemnation, and death. Verse 10, For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. Comparison 5, The ministry of the law, although it was glorious, was exceedingly excelled by the glory of the ministry of the gospel, or of grace, that it not deserves to be called glorious, but let it vanish rather in comparison, as the glory of the stars when the sun appears is obscured. But the ministry of the gospel is simply, and by way of excellency, glorious. Verse 11. For if that which was done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Comparison 6. The ministry of the covenant of works, in respect to the annexed ceremonies, hath only the glory of temporal dispensation, because so long it was to endure, whilst men in the infancy of the church, convicted of sins, and of their own impotency to deliver themselves, were taught to fly unto Christ, and, as it were, by the hand of a schoolmaster, might be led to him, which manner of instructing the church being now at its full growth, and continuing under the brightness of the revealed gospel, is abolished as unprofitable. But the ministry of the new covenant hath permanent glory, until the glorious coming of Christ. Verse 12. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. 
Verse 13, And not as Moses which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Comparison 7, The ministry of the new covenant is plain and perspicuous, so that the ministers thereof can plainly and confidently preach the way of salvation, having Christ now revealed, who in times past being to come was hoped for. But the ministry of the law, as it did appear in the type of the mosaical ministration, was obscure and wrapped up in types. Put. He follows this comparison to the end of the chapter, illustrating the latter part thereof to the last verse in this sense. Moses, the minister of the law, turned from the tabernacle, from the altar, from the ark, and the propitiatory, speaking with his face veiled, signified to the people, and typically related the nature of the legal covenant of works, and of its ministry divided from Christ, and did also figure out the blindness of the people under the legal covenant, because they did not perceive Christ to be the end of the law, and temporal ceremonies now abolished. Verse 14. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Verse 15, But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. The Apostle observes that now blindness also may be perceived in the Jews, who, while they read the Old Testament, they see nothing besides the veil of ceremonies, because the veil of ignorance and infidelity remaineth upon their minds, which veil, represented by the type of the external veil covering Moses' face, by Christ is taken away from all the faithful, for righteousness, life, virtue, and lastly, all grace and glory is published and communicated to the faithful in Christ. But hitherto this veil doth remain upon the hearts of the unbelieving Jews. Verse 16. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. He hath hope of the Jews' conversion, when by the grace of God the heart of the Israelites, or the doctrine of Moses now veiled, should be turned by them to God, i.e. should be brought according to this typical signification to Christ, who is the end of the law. Then the veil of ignorance and of the darkness of ceremonies should be taken from them, as the veil was taken from the face of Moses when he entered in unto God, sitting betwixt the cherubims, chiefly that they might see God their Lord and their Saviour Christ, and might acknowledge him to be the true end of the whole law. Verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The reason of this is given, because one... Christ is the spirit, or the soul of all ceremonies, that a spiritual thing is signified by them. 2. Christ is also the spirit, or the soul of the moral law, because he fulfilled the law, in whom alone the perfect righteousness of the law is to be found. 3. Christ is the spirit, because he quickens those that believe to new obedience and life everlasting, and he delivereth those from sin and misery. For when it is said, where the spirit of Christ the Lord is, or where Christ is, there is liberty. The liberty is to be understood not from the obedience of the commandments, but from the ceremonial yoke, from the bondage of sin and yoke of the legal covenant, and all evils which do follow from its violation. Liberty, I say, was given to the faithful by the spirit of the gospel, at leastwise that which belongeth to them of right, although not always according to sense, nor ever before the end of life, as to a full possession. For although the spirit with a loud voice proclaimeth that there is a gate opened unto us, that we may go out of prison, Yet we, by reason of the weakness of faith, do go slowly forth. And this is the explication of the first part of the comparison concerning the ministry of the law. Verse 18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Here followeth another branch of the comparison concerning the ministry of the gospel in those that believe, which is propounded in this sense. But we, that by the ministry of the gospel believe in Christ, the veil of ceremonies and ignorance, the veil of infidelity and hardness of heart also being removed, are freely admitted to the clear beholding of Christ, and the glory of the grace of God shining in the gospel, as in a glass, and beholding Christ by faith we are sanctified, and more and more made happy in conformity with Christ, increased daily by degrees from one measure of glory and sanctity to another, and that by the powerful working of the Holy Ghost, Sanctification is called glory, because sanctification is the beginning of glorification, for by that the image of God is repaired in us, which is our glory. End of chapter 3、Chapter、4 of the Second Epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, analytically expounded by David Dixon, translated by William Retchford. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4. He goes on to defend his ministry. There are two parts of this chapter. In the first he proveth his faithfulness or sincerity in the ministry by seven arguments to the sixth verse. In the second he confirms the seventh argument by answering the objections concerning the scandal of the cross lying upon him to the end. Verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. Argument 1. The inward testimony of so glorious a ministry committed unto me by the mercy of God is effectual to sustain me, lest I be overcome in the doing of my duty with the burden of evils, and that, by the measure of grace given to me, I go forward valiantly. From hence, therefore, it appeareth that I am sincere and faithful. For modesty's sake he joineth others, but he himself in the conflict was especially aimed at by his adversaries. Verse 2. But having renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Argument 2. I have renounced ambition, covetousness, and the other shameful lusts, which some, secretly indulging, do cover this their disgrace in corners, under other, or the like, veils and pretenses. Therefore I am faithful. Not with. Argument 3. I have not walked in craftiness, deceitfully handling the word of God, or bending and fitting that to the dispositions of men, as the false apostles do. Therefore I am faithful. By manifestation. Argument 4. I have carried myself so mildly in the clear preaching of the word of God, that the consciences of all men are compelled to acknowledge my integrity, of which thing also I have God to my witness, therefore I am faithful. Verse 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Verse 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Objection. But how comes it to pass that thy doctrine is not understood by so many wise and potent men, if it be so clearly taught? He answers that the ignorance of the gospel, so plainly unfolded to them, was no argument of the obscurity of the doctrine, but of the incredulity of the hearer, and his future perdition from the blindness of unbelievers, blinded by the devil whom the world serves. For the devil further blindeth the blind infidels, lest they should see God offering himself in Christ, lest they should behold Christ to their salvation, shining in the gospel, who hath brought forth the invisible God, as to our view, by his doctrine and power manifested in the flesh, that we may behold God in Christ, the true image of God the Father. Verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. Argument 5. Of the Apostles' fidelity, I, saith he, seek the glory of Christ alone, and acknowledge Christ only, Lord in the Church. Truly I declare myself and other teachers, not only ministers of Christ, but also of his people, that Christ alone may be exalted. Therefore I show myself faithful. Verse 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Argument 6. Confirming the former, wherein he compares his conversion to Pharisaism, to the creation of light out of darkness, God, who by his omnipotent word hath produced light out of darkness, by no less efficacy hath he brought me, lost sinner, out of the darkness of Pharisaism and sin, and hath so powerfully enlarged my heart, illuminated by the light of Christ his glorious Son, that I cannot but communicate to others this glorious knowledge of the grace of God given to me, manifestly shining in Christ. Therefore it behoveth me to be faithful. Verse 7. But we have these treasures in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God, and not of us. Argument 7. God, by showing my infirmity in all exercises, and also by maintaining his strength in me under frequent afflictions, and by keeping me constant hitherto, hath rendered my faithfulness commendable with all men. Therefore I can affirm myself faithful. The second part. He so handles this argument, that in the meanwhile he solves two objections, that he might take away the scandal of the cross. Earthen. Objection 1. In the meanwhile, thy condition of life is miserable and contemptible as a certain earthen vessel. He answers four manner of ways. 1. That it is true that he is an earthen vessel, frail and contemptible, but notwithstanding he contains the treasure of grace and the knowledge of the gospel. May be of God. Furthermore, he answers that 
that happened by the wisdom of God, lest the glory of the conversion and salvation of so many men should be ascribed to the virtue of the apostle, that it should be wholly ascribed unto God, for by so much the more the power of God is conspicuous in great works, by how much the weakness of the instrument more evidently appeareth. Verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Verse 9. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. He answers 3. That all his afflictions are moderated, and he himself is upheld by God in all things. That he is not destitute of the help of God, doth not sink under his burden. That he doth not forsake God, nor despair. Is not forsaken of God, not left or lost. Therefore it matters nothing how weak he is in himself. We are afflicted, he saith, yet not distressed i.e., on every side we are troubled with adversity, but we are not brought into such straits as to be overwhelmed, but we are preserved by the help of God in the midst of afflictions. We are perplexed, but not in despair, i.e., we doubt sometimes what may be done in the dangers of this life, but we are not so destitute that we are void of all counsel. We are persecuted, but not forsaken, i.e., God permits us to be vexed and evil entreated by the enemies of the gospel, but he neither permits us to be slain before the time by him determined, neither doth he withdraw his consolations from us. We are cast down, but not destroyed. That is, we sometimes seem presently ready to perish, but God helping us, we are kept from perishing. Verse 10. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. He answers, 4. That his afflictions make for the glory of Christ, because the image of Christ suffering and dying may be seen in them, and that the virtue and strength of Christ living may appear in supporting him under so many afflictions. Therefore it matters not how weak he may be in himself. Verse 11. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our mortal flesh. He confirms this from thence, that the apostles, who lived in the midst of troubles by the strength of Christ's spirit for the cause of Christ, daily undergo danger, that the quickening virtue of Christ may more and more appear in sustaining their fleshly infirmities, obnoxious to that miserable condition. Verse 12, So then, death worketh in us, but life in you. Objection 2. But not necessarily, because thou art the servant of Christ, therefore thou shouldst be also miserable and contemned. For we Corinthians are Christians, and yet we live more prosperously. He answers four manner of ways. One, by granting it to be so, yet by the wisdom of God it comes to pass, that in some stronger Christians, as the apostles, the image of Christ dying might rather appear at least to the world. But in others, as the weaker Corinthians, the efficacy of Christ's life, supporting them under extreme afflictions, might be more apparent to the world. Verse 13. We, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore have I spoken, we also believe, and therefore speak. Verse 14, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, and present us with you. He answers too, although the apostles may be afflicted more than the Corinthians, yet there is the same spirit of faith both in them and in the Corinthians by which faith, believing with David, Psalm 116, verse 10, the apostle dare promise to himself, together with the Corinthians, a glorious resurrection, although now he is more pressed under the cross than they. Verse 15, For all things are for your sake, that the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, redound to the glory of God. He answers 3, that he was afflicted for their consolation and confirmation, as also that from his afflictions and deliverances, occasion of praying and suffering together with the apostles might not only be given to the corinthians but also occasion of thanksgiving with them for their eminent deliverances from trouble which god forthwith granted to him with the rest of the apostles and was about to grant verse sixteen for which cause we faint not but though our outward man perish yet the inward man is renewed day by day he answers four that he was not tired nor wearied by his afflictions, whereof he subjoins three reasons. Reason one, because as much as was diminished of those goods that made for the maintaining the state of this present life, so much was added to his holiness for the increasing of his spiritual life. Verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Reason, too, because it did procure an unspeakable weight of glory, to the promoting of which afflictions help, 
as instruments and means both of mortification and glorification, so that no afflictions are to be accounted of, yea, truly the lightness of afflictions, which is but for a moment, clearly vanisheth and becomes as nothing in comparison with future glory. Verse 18. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Reason 3. Why he doth not wax faint is, because, saith he, by faith I look at things eternal and invisible, by reason of which I despise all temporal and visible, i.e., both riches, honours, and profits, etc. I do not look at, because those are only durable for a time, but I have my mind intent upon those good and eternal things which God hath promised. Therefore I do not weigh the loss of temporal things, by all which the Apostle confirmeth the Corinthians, lest they should be offended at his afflictions. End of chapter 4Chapter 5 of the Second Epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, analytically expounded by David Dixon, translated by William Retchford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 5. He goes on to show more fully his faithfulness in the ministry by mentioning seven impellent causes whereby he was moved to faithfulness in the discharge of his duty. Verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The first impellent cause to faithfulness in the ministry is his certain confidence of a blessed immortality, which after death remains for him, and all the rest of the faithful ministers of Christ, of which felicity also the body shall be partaker in the resurrection. I am persuaded, saith he, that after the dissolution of this my frail body, I shall continually enjoy felicity of soul, and the glorious immortality of a raised body, why should not I therefore be faithful, so long as I dwell in this mortal body? Verse 2. For in this we groan earnestly, desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from the heaven. The solidity of this, his confidence or persuasion, is confirmed by seven signs, all which did stir up his mind to faithfulness. Sign 1. Is a desire of departing out of this life, that he might obtain immortality, or be endued instead of a corruptible body with immortal glory, an argument certainly of a mind conscious of its sincerity, and certified of future happiness. Verse 3. If so be that, being clothed, we shall not be found naked. He limits this sign and privilege of being endued with future glory, that it may belong to those only who, departing out of this life to an immortal and immutable state, are not found naked, i.e. not destitute of that true covering whereby our filthy nakedness is covered, which covering is Christ, or Christ's righteousness, which can alone cover our sins, wherein our nakedness consists. This, therefore, is the second sign of his solid desire of going out of this life, and of a mind very conscious of the faithful administration of his office, that he knew himself to be in the number of those to whom alone the certainty of being clothed upon with glory belonged, to wit of those who are clothed already with that covering, whereby the foul nakedness of sinners is covered, i.e. the righteousness of Christ, with which, except a man be clothed in this life, he shall be found naked in the other, and shall remain naked for ever. Verse 4. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Sign 3. That the desire of his departing this life, arising from this confidence, was holy, i.e., it was derived not so much from the weariness of natural life, but from the hope of a better, this is that which he saith, although he groan and be sorrowful in his body, yet he would not be unclothed of this body, but that this body might be clothed upon with immortality, and that mortality might be swallowed up of immortality. Verse 5. Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of his spirit. Sign 4. That this desire is not natural, but the supernatural work of God, stirred up and formed in the hearts of his own by the special work of God. It is God that hath wrought, formed, and created us for this thing. His confidence, therefore, is solid. Who also? Sign 5. That this confidence of a better life is sealed by the earnest of the Spirit, having, as it were, a taste and experience of that life in the peace and joy of the Spirit, i.e., in the first fruits of that happiness which is to come. Verse 6. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. 
sign six that his confidence is firmly grounded in the certain persuasion of his nigher access to the lord which should be vouchsafed to him after death when doubtless even as in one house he should dwell with god who now in the body is absent from the lord verse seven for we walk by faith not by sight verse eight we are confident i say and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the lord sign seven confirming the former that he knoweth himself to walk by faith in this life and not by sight of the beatifical vision which abideth for us in the life to come who in our sense are absent from the lord while we are present in the body therefore more vehemently and confidently he did both desire and choose to go to the lord rather than to remain in the body verse nine wherefore we labour that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him that this confidence confirmed by so many signs of sincerity was the impellent cause to his faithfulness in the ministry he now expressly declares because whatsoever change towards life or death did happen to him out of this confidence he did endeavour to please god with no less diligence than those which contend for honour that both in this life or pilgrimage and in his death or approaching to god he might be made acceptable to him verse ten for we must all appear before the judgment seat of christ that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done whether it be good or evil his second impellent cause to faithfulness in his ministry is the consideration of punishments and rewards which abide every one according to their works at the last judgment in which god will inflict punishments upon the wicked but to the godly whose good works after their sins are pardoned only remain he shall render rewards verse eleven Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also we are manifest in your consciences. He shows by calling God and the consciences of the Corinthians to be his witnesses, that this argument hath urged him to faithfulness in the ministry, for the apprehension of that future terrible judgment hath affected this, that he exhorted all to reconciliation with God by faith. Verse 12 for we commend not ourselves again unto you but give you occasion to glory on our behalf that you may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart he solves two objections which his adversaries may object against him so earnestly glorying of his faithfulness objection one thou o paul gloriest some one may say whilst thou commendest thyself he answers that he did not say these things for that end but that the corinthians may have that for his defence whereby to repress their vain and boasting teachers who did diminish the authority of the apostle amongst them and did glory in the presence of men otherwise than their conscience and the truth of the matter did permit for they being destitute of piety or matter of glorying in heart they gloried in their adulterated eloquence verse thirteen for whether we be besides ourselves it is to god or whether we be sober it is for your cause objection two but o paul thou art besides thyself who doest so openly confute such teachers he answers that he did not dispute but give a reason of the fact as it did become a wise man to wit that he uttered those things for the glory of god and their salvation for says he if i praise my ministry which seems to be the part of one besides himself i do it for the glory of god lest my gospel should be undervalued if I speak humbly of myself, as sober men used to do, I do it for your good. Verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then were all dead. The third impellent cause to faithfulness, containing a reason of the former saying, is his love, wherewith he loved Christ, which did cast upon him as it were bonds, and constraineth him, that he, being unmindful of himself, did both speak and do those things only, which might promote the glory of Christ and the good of the church. Verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live to themselves, but unto him which died for them, and rose again. He giveth a reason of his love, and adds the fourth impellent cause, to wit, the love of Christ to us. Christ, says he, when we were all dead in respect of our desert and the justice of God, alone died in the room of all of us that believe in him, that we, being delivered from deserved perdition, should not serve ourselves, but Christ our Redeemer. Why, therefore, should not I be faithful in the business of Christ? Verse 16. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh, Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. He prevents an objection to this end, that he might give account why he checked those glorious Corinthian doctors, 
not regarding his esteem with the ignorant, so that he might promote the glory of Christ and the church's safety. Some one might say, but it behoved him to regard the dignity of so many worthy teachers amongst the Corinthians, who shined with eloquence, learning, riches, honours, and nobility of parentage, for some of these were of the Jews, and perhaps did boast that they were of the tribe of Judah, and did arrive to Christ's kindred, as it is credible from what follows. He answers three ways, drawing every one of his answers as conclusions from verse 12. Answer 1, that he doth not look at riches, honours, parentage, eloquence, and the rest, neither did he esteem any man from outward things, by which the esteem of men is increased or diminished with worldlings, and those that are carnal. Yea, Answer two, that he did not judge any more of Christ himself according to his external condition or detract from his estimation by reason of his poverty and ignominy in the world, as in times past he esteemed, being in a mistake, and therefore he did not esteem any one more valuable because of his riches, honours, and parentage, etc. Verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. Answer three, showing the duty of the faithful engrafted into Christ to be this, that as new creatures they should labour for the newness of a right judgment and an holy life, and that these worldly things should not be so highly esteemed, he proves from Isaiah 65, verse 17, where God promiseth an abolition of old things, and that he will make a new heaven and new earth, i.e. all things new under the kingdom of Christ, whence it follows that those things only are to be had in estimation amongst Christians which reach to a new creature, or regeneration. For all things are made new to those that are renewed when they are reconciled to God, that have all creatures as it were reconciled to them, and now they use them after a new manner for the glory of God and their own salvation, setting a price upon everything according as it makes or not makes for the promoting of the kingdom of God in themselves and others. Verse 18 and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. The fifth impellent cause to faithfulness in his ministry is the grace and goodness of God towards him, which cause, returning to his purpose and looking up to God, he asserts the author of the new creature, whereof he had even now spoken, and of all graces, because the grace of God towards him had brought to him a double privilege, to wit reconciliation by Christ, and a ministerial office for the reconciliation of others. From hence he acknowledges a twofold obligation for his faithfulness in the ministry. Why, therefore, should not he approve himself faithful? Verse 19. To wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. The sixth impellent cause is the excellency of preaching, of which he propounds a short collection, wherein one, the Father, who by reason of sin was removed far from us, declares himself to come near unto us in Christ, who is the true Emmanuel, God with us. Two, the Father reconciled, as for his part, declares himself to do that in Christ, for the elect world, that they, beholding their enmities betwixt themselves and God, as for their part, may come again into favour, and be reconciled with God through Christ. Three, the means is shown by which men may be reconciled to God, viz. by remission, or a not imputing of sins, which God most graciously doth offer. Four, the instrument of applying the grace of reconciliation obtained by Christ is shown, viz. the word of reconciliation committed to the apostles and to the other ministers, in which so excellent and so necessary a ministry he could not be but faithful when he set those things before him. Verse 20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. The seventh impellent cause to faithfulness is the excellency of the person which he represents, which cause he propounds, and together with the whole precedent doctrine he makes use of, by which very thing showing the endeavour of his faithfulness. To this end he importunes all, and diligently urges all with his authority as an ambassador, and also submissively and lovingly, as bearing the image of God, that every one would more heartily accept the reconciliation offered of God, that the remainders of enmity being taken away, which unbelief cherisheth within, all may become the same spirit with God. Verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Lastly, that he may persuade to the obedience of faith, and to the receiving of a fuller measure of reconciliation, 
he showeth that an open and expedient way to reconciliation is because christ the innocent mediator and pure from sin by his consent and agreement with the father in a judicial manner is accounted guilty of our sin yea truly he was made an expiatory sacrifice for our sin expressly for that end that we believing in christ may be made partakers of christ's righteousness judicially by imputation and so may be made perfectly righteous and as it were by that righteousness which chiefly pleases god through this excellent and divine way of reconciliation which the wisdom of god hath invented and grace hath made ours but he adds this in him that we might necessarily understand that we are engrafted into christ by faith by which this righteousness may be ours because from our conjunction with christ by faith follows our judicial union with christ from this union imputation is made of the obedience and righteousness of christ to us and at length the application of all his gifts even to perfect felicity which being considered what can be said more efficaciously to stir all of us up that our enmities being acknowledged and our necessities we may embrace reconciliation offered in christ the sum therefore of these three verses is that the apostle when he had weighed the dispensation of man's redemption and the reason of bringing the elect to reconciliation and salvation he could not but employ himself strongly and faithfully in his ministry for when he knew by the covenant concerning the redemption of the elect between god and his son the second person of the trinity invested with the office of a mediator and a surety god being so abundantly satisfied he now becomes gracious to the world of the redeemed or elect concurring with christ the mediator for the applying of reconciliation obtained for all the redeemed and he importunes them by christ and by the servants of christ the ministers of the gospel no less seriously than the redeemer himself and prays them that now he himself being reconciled they would be reconciled when i say the apostle knew these things and that there was a charge committed to him that he should promote this reconciliation what wonder then if he earnestly strived that men might be turned to god and when he knew that by covenant christ had took upon himself all the sins of all the redeemed and was made a propitiatory sacrifice for the expiating of their sins imputed to him under this condition that the redeemed such all the faithful show themselves to be clothed with the righteousness of god or the righteousness of christ should be accounted most righteous in the mind of god and at length should be fully renewed by the holy spirit what wonder then if he confidently and constantly prosecuted the business of reconciliation and showed himself faithful in executing his ministry end of chapter five Chapter 6 of the Second Epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, analytically expounded by David Dixon, translated by William Retchford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 That, as yet further, he may commend the exercise of his ministry more fully to the consciences of the Corinthians, putting before their eyes a minister faithful in work and example, he draws a threefold exhortation from the premises that they may bring forth the fruit of his ministry there are three parts of the chapter of which the first is an exhortation seriously to receive the grace offered by him to verse eleven the second is an exhortation to receive him for the apostle of christ to verse fourteen and the third is an exhortation to shun the contagion of idolatry to the end verse one we then as workers together with him beseech you also that ye receive not the grace of god in vain the first exhortation is that they would receive the grace of reconciliation more seriously and with fruit and suffer not the grace of god offered in the gospel by their fault to want its full fruit in them that they may obtain righteousness peace life and all things which christ hath obtained for them the proposition he urges is this ye ought not to receive the grace of god in vain i e in outward profession only without its internal virtue this he proves by three arguments argument one we ministers of god being co-workers that his work may be promoted in you granted from him to you by free gift promising our endeavour for the promoting of your salvation earnestly desired that of you therefore ye would not receive the grace of god in vain verse two for he saith i have heard thee in a time accepted and in a day of salvation have i succoured thee behold now is the accepted time behold now is the day of salvation argument two in a parenthesis because now the time is acceptable in which by the intercession of christ the grace of god is efficacious to the producing of fruit in all those that receive the gospel with serious affection of heart and desire to bring forth fruit which he proves out of isaiah forty nine verse eight 
where the Father speaketh to the Mediator interceding for them, and by his Spirit breathing in them. Therefore you must beware, lest this opportunity of grace be in vain offered to you. Verse 3. Giving no offence in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. Argument 3. Joined with the first verse. We ministers which exhort you, and I by name Paul, we are approved by all manner of ways, and we are found faithful in the ministry of the gospel, not hindering you, but that you may profit by our ministry, that so ye may pretend nothing, but that ye may persevere in the grace of the gospel. Therefore ye ought not to receive the grace of the gospel in vain, but to contend for the receiving of and expressing the virtue of the gospel. He confirms the antecedent by an induction of the virtues which prove ministers faithful, with which he was first of all by the grace of God adorned. There are five parts of the induction. In the first part he removes from himself those vices whereby idle teachers were wont to create offences to the gospel, demolishing more by their manners in the edifice of God than by their doctrine they edify, and yielding occasion to the wicked of speaking ill of his ministry or of the office of ministers. Verse 4. But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in affliction, in necessities, in distresses, Verse 5. In stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labours, in watchings, in fastings. In the second part he recites diverse kinds of virtues with which his ministry is adorned, but namely he mentions his patience exercised in nine kinds of evils, in all which without murmuring he patiently executed the offices of his ministry, for he strongly endured the troubles of his journeys with want and dangers. The snares of his persecutors' prison and tumults stirred up against him, and in preaching, his labour, watchings, fastings, neither did he wax faint in the work of the Lord. Verse 6. By pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. In the third part, he adds other six virtues of his patience, of which the first is his freedom from the pollutions of the world, whilst he conversed amongst those of the world. 2. His discretion in handling his auditors. 3. His forbearance in provocations. 4. His gentleness in his commerce with more difficult things. 5. His spiritual disposition in all things. 6. His sincere love towards all. Verse 7. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armour of righteousness, on the right hand and on the left. In the fourth part he reckons the virtues which did belong to the discharge of his duty. 1. He preached nothing besides the truth of God. 2. He demonstrated the power of the Spirit in his speech. 3. He contended against all his enemies with spiritual weapons, i.e. with lawful means, on the right hand in prosperity, on the left hand in adversity, and in every change and vicissitude of things he did remain constant, lest he should either by enticements or by terrors turn out of the right way. Verse 8. By honour and dishonour, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true. Verse 9. As unknown and yet well known, as dying, and behold, we live, as chastened, and not killed. Verse 10. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. In the first part, he boasts that he hath always continued in a right way, whether ignominy or infamy, whether glory or fame followed. For when he was counted as an impostor, he declared himself one that spake truth, when he was accounted as ignoble and contemptible, he did manifest himself by his deeds, that they who had eyes might acknowledge him to be the servant of the Most High God. He seemed even as dead, and in the midst of death he triumphed notwithstanding, that he performed his duty as being alive, yet chastened with many stripes even to death, he was kept by God, lest he should die, by reason of those evils which pressed him, sometimes under a pretense he was sad, but by the Spirit in God he did always rejoice. He was counted poor, but through the gospel, by the manifold love of God, he did enrich many, not only by showing the manner of contentation in the gospel, but also instructing men to virtue and piety, which is profitable for all things. He wanted possessions and revenues, and yet contented with his lot, he did rejoice as much as was fitting in the use of all things. The second part, verse 11, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. The second part of the chapter follows, in which the second exhortation of Paul to the Corinthians is, that they would love again that apostle, viz. of Christ, who had undergone so many labours in the ministry for their good. To this exhortation he premises five arguments. 
argument one plainly and ingenuously that i may use liberty of speech with friends most freely with an heart enlarged and with an open mouth publishing what good will inwardly i have towards you why therefore do ye not require me in like manner verse twelve ye are not straitened in us but ye are straitened in your own bowels verse thirteen now for a recompense in the same i speak as unto my children be ye also enlarged argument two there is nothing in me why you should not apprehend my love but through the straightness of your own hearts who do not believe that thy good will is so great towards you ye are not straitened argument three ye are bound to love me again who so exceedingly love you therefore as out of equity requite me by loving me and persuading yourselves that ye are beloved of me as unto dear children argument four i am your father and you my sons therefore as my sons love me as your father for a recompense argument five now i require a debt from you therefore be ye enlarged i .e. admit ye with an enlarged heart the persuasion of my lovingness and my parental admonitions proceeding out of lovingness and likewise love ye me again the third part verse fourteen be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness verse fifteen and what concord hath christ with belial or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel the third exhortation that they abstain from all unlawful society with unbelievers by whom they may be hindered lest they should serve god or be alienated from the true religion or anyways polluted of this kind of society is matrimony by which men easily or women may be wrapped in a consent to wickedness by idolaters because of all kind of society this is nearest that which he seems to tax first of all is the society or communion of the faithful corinthians with their unbelieving companions in external idolatry wherewith they polluted themselves eating together with those idolatrous sacrifices in the idol's temple as it appears in the former epistle chapter eight in which idolatry or in any other sin he forbids to draw with them in the same yoke of impiety the arguments of the exhortation are four for what argument one your condition and profession of christians on the one part and the sins of idolatry which are openly professed on the other part they are no less opposed by one another than righteousness and iniquity light and darkness christ and the devil faith and infidelity the temple of god and idols amongst which there can be no communion therefore no communion with you christians or to be with unbelievers in idolatry or in any other sins which unbelievers openly profess or in any other necessity out of which may arise an inseparable danger of communicating with their sins he did not forbid them to inhabit in the same city with them neither to negotiate or eat meat if they should be invited to dinner or supper verse sixteen and what agreement hath the temple of god with idols for ye are the temple of the living god as god hath said i will dwell in them and walk in them and i will be their god and they shall be my people argument two ye are the holy temple of god which he proveth by the testimony of moses leviticus twenty six verse twelve and ezekiel thirty seven verse twenty seven therefore it is not lawful for you to pollute yourselves by society with unbelievers chiefly in that in which are the temple of idols professedly Verse 17. Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Verse 18. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Argument 3. God commandeth you to separate from idolaters at the pollutions of the world, and not to touch them. Therefore you ought to beware of them. I will receive. Argument 4 from the promises which god hath made to those who keep themselves pure from the defilements of the world nor participate with other men's sins god will be a father to them i e in a recompense of all hurt and full consolation against all evils which they looking to themselves may suffer from other men's sins god will communicate himself to them and will manifest his paternal affection towards them really End of chapter six Chapter 7 of the Second Epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, analytically expounded by David Dixon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7. Verse 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. The first verse of this chapter belongs to the precedent chapter, wherein, from the former promises, he draws an exhortation that 
they do not only beware of idolatry and its outward appearance but also from all defilements of spirit and body i e from sins which either pollute the soul within or defile the soul and the body also and endeavours the perfecting of holiness going forward and proceeding in the fear of god using one argument for all the promises forespoken of made to you by god do justly require that from you therefore apply yourselves diligently to these duties thus too receive us we have wronged no man we have corrupted no man we have defrauded no man in the rest of the chapter he endeavours to oblige the hearts of the Corinthians to him, the signs of his love towards them being produced, in the unfolding of which he insists to the end. The proposition is clearly propounded, which is to be confirmed. O Corinthians, ye ought to receive us, i.e. to be persuaded of my love towards you, ye ought to love me again, and to lay up my exhortations in your enlarged hearts. Three arguments are taken from the three signs of the Apostle's good will towards them. No man... Argument 1. That they should receive the Apostle and the first sign of his little ill towards them, because I do not ill deserve of any one, either by bringing reproach or corrupting by perverse doctrine, or defrauding any one by any means. Verse 3. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die and live with you. Argument 2. Sign 2. Because when I speak of the things foregoing, it was only for the clearing of myself, I am so far from condemning the church of the believing Corinthians, that out of love I have determined the contrary, to cleave to you in prosperity and adversity, in life and death, that no change at any time may draw my affection from you. Verse 4. Great is my boldness of speech towards you, great is my glorying of you, I am filled with comfort, I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. Argument 3. Sign 3. Because news being received concerning your repentance, my heart so rejoiceth in the midst of afflictions, that I dare safely speak the confidence of my mind towards you concerning your perseverance and glory of you amongst others. Verse 5. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Verse 6. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. He, being about to explain the experiment of his good will towards them, propounds his afflictions, wherewith he was pressed in Macedonia, whilst he expected news from them. He was oppressed partly by persecution of the enemies, partly by the intestine evils of the church, partly by the anxiety of his mind, and also with the troubles of his body, that there was no rest to his outward man. Against all which troubles, by mercy of God, consolation was sufficiently administered to him by the coming of Titus who had now returned from the Corinthians, and brought joyful news concerning their state. Verse 7, And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind towards me, so that I rejoiced the more. The apostle reckoneth eight causes of his joyfulness, whereof many were signs of his good will towards them. One, because Titus was returned safe. Two, because Titus had received consolation from you Corinthians. 3. Because I had heard by Titus concerning your pious affection towards me, and desire of seeing me, concerning your weeping for the wickedness committed amongst you, concerning your zeal against the incestuous person, and against my backbiters, from whence hath abounded joy to me, much surpassing all that grief which I have taken for that matter. Verse 8. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it were but for a season. Before he propounds the fourth cause of his consolation, he solves an objection, which solution did make much to the purpose. They might say, Thou hast made us sorrowful in the former epistle. The answer is fourfold. Answer one, I was compelled, and not without grief, have I made you sad. But this grief, through your repentance, hath ceased. For when the apostle writ the epistle, being uncertain concerning the event, he was sad, i.e., that he saith, that he himself repented. But when he saw the event, he was freed from grief, i.e., now he says he did not repent. Answer 2. That sadness which was moved by my epistle was short. Verse 9. Now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. He answers, 3. That sadness is turned into joy, both to you and me, because it is found now good and profitable to repentance, 
which he proves because it brought forth repentance not to be repented of, otherwise than worldly sorrow is wont, which only increaseth sin and misery, and bringeth death as well to the soul as to the body. Verse 11. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge, in all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. He proveth that their sadness was after God, or pious, because it produced seven effects in them, even so many signs of their repentance, whereof the first was the shaking off security with a carefulness to mend what was amiss. Two is an apology, that now by no means they approve either the fact of the incestuous person or their own negligence. Three is an indignation against the sin, both of the incestuous person and their own in suffering him. Four is a fear lest they should be compassed with divine justice or a new sin. Five is a desire taking off the scandal and satisfying all good men. Six, his zeal and fervent desire in prosecuting all means for the removing of evil and repairing of the damage. Seven is his revenge in chastising the incestuous person and all their dullness, in all which the Corinthians had declared their repentance and had showed themselves no ways delighted with wickedness, but that they were clear. Verse 12. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. The fourth answer to the objection is, I have not written that epistle either only or chiefly that in chastising of the incestuous person satisfaction might be given to the father, with whose wife the son had committed adultery, or that the incestuous person might be corrected, which truly was not to be neglected, but especially for this end, that my fatherly care towards you, O Corinthians, might appear to all, sincere and approved in the sight of God. Verse 13. Therefore we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. The objection being solved, he adds the fourth cause of his consolation. I understand, says he, that ye have taken in good part my reproof, and now have received consolation. Of Titus, the fifth cause of his consolation, because all ye have endeavoured to refresh the spirit of Titus. Verse 14. For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed, but as we speak all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found a truth. The sixth cause, that you would prove in very deed that which I boasting of you confidently foretold to Titus. Verse 15. And his inward affection is more abundantly towards you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling ye received him. The seventh cause because you have engaged to you by your respects and goodness the mind of Titus, which you may esteem as great gain, for they reverenced Titus as an evangelist and a servant of God, sent to them extraordinarily, and so they had reconciled the mind of Titus to themselves. Verse 16. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. The eighth cause of consolation, that I, being encouraged by this experience, for the future... I may dare to promise the best things whatsoever of you all, both to myself and others. End of chapter 7。Chapter 8 of the Second Epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, analytically expounded by David Dixon, translated by William Retchford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8. The second part of the epistle, wherein the Corinthians being confirmed, touching his love towards them, doth exhort them to the giving of alms, with a cheerful mind, to the use of the poor Jews. For this end, there are thirteen arguments used in this chapter, to which he adds more in the chapter following. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you, to wit, of the grace of God, bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Argument 1. From the example of the Macedonians, the churches of Macedonia have contributed, and therefore do ye the same thing whose liberality he commends, by nine reasons. Grace. The first reason, because it was the gift of God's grace that they contributed anything for the use of the poor Jews. Verse 2. How that, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of liberality. Reason 2. Because alms was given by them in that time, when they were tried with heavy afflictions. Joy. Reason 3. Because they contributed with joy. Deep, reason four, because in poverty they were liberal. 
verse 3, for to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. Reason 5, because they were willing to give more bountifully than they were able. Verse 4, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. Reason 6, because they offered freely, not provoked by others' examples, but rather were leaders to others, lest they should be wanting in this duty of charity. With entreaty, reason 7, because they were instant in prayers, that what they gave might be received. Fellowship, reason 8, because they did entreat the apostle, that he, together with others, would take upon them the charge of gathering and dispensing that which they and others were about to give. Verse 5, and this they did, not as we hoped, but first they gave their own selves to the Lord, and unto us by the will of God. Reason 9. Because beyond the apostles' expectation, they consecrated themselves and all theirs to God, and did commit themselves to the apostle, that they might be ruled by him in all things according to the will of God. For 6. Insomuch that we desired Titus, that, as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Argument 2. To a liberal contribution, because at the entreaty of the Macedonians I have desired Titus that he would take care to accomplish your alms, which thing he hath undertaken already. Therefore take ye care, lest this our labour be in vain. Verse 7. Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that ye abound in this grace also. Argument 3. Because, seeing that you excel others in many virtues, it becometh you to do your endeavour, lest in this ye fail, or seeing that the gifts of the Spirit abound in you, the faith of miracles, the gifts of knowledge and eloquence, endeavour concerning the salvation of the brethren, and charity towards me, ye must have a care, lest this gift be found wanting to you. Verse 8. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove the sincerity of your love. Argument 4 because now the sincerity of your Christian love is to be proved in the distribution of this alms, for which things sake I exhort you diligently at the desire of the Macedonians, commanding nothing imperiously, therefore show a proof of your liberality. Verse 9, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye, through his poverty, might become rich. Argument 5, Christ hath made himself poor, that you might be rich. Therefore it is meet, that for his sake ye give alms when it is required of you. Verse 10, And herein I give my advice, for it is expedient for you, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Argument 6, Because I know it is profitable for you, both in respect of your praise, and in respect of the blessing that will follow, that in this business in no wise ye be wanting, but at length ye accomplish this collection already begun. Verse 11, now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which you have. Verse 12. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. Verse 13. For I mean not that other men be eased and you burdened. Argument 7. Because it is meet and comely that your ready will, which ye showed the last year, might be actually completed, and it will be uncomely if it otherwise fall out. Which ye have, argument 8, because nothing is required but that which yourselves may see to be equal, for it is desired that you give according to your abilities out of equity without your prejudice. A little from the poor sort, if they give with a willing mind, shall be accepted of God, although they have not given much which have it not. For if a willing mind be not present, Nothing is respected by God, how much soever is given, therefore be not here wanting. Verse 14. But by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be an equality. Argument 9. Because you may expect that if there be need, some retribution may be made, and out of the plenty of the churches in Judea, your want may be supplied, that so that which is equal may be done. Verse 15. As it is written, He that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. Argument 10. Because it appears in the example of manner that no man ought to suppress his abundance with others' wants, but so far equality is to be observed that so much as is necessary may be wanting to none. 
for as it was done in the gathering of manna, every one did measure to himself an omer, the rest was given to those who had gathered little. Exodus 16, verses 18 and 19. So in gathering of riches, that which remaineth after your own uses, ought to be given for the use of the poor. Verse 16. But thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into the heart of Titus for you. Verse 17. For indeed he accepted the exhortation, but being more forward of his own accord, he went unto you. Argument 11. Because the faithful, the strong, and some brethren of best fame were stirred up by God. Compare verses 18 and 22. And sent by me to promote this whole business, not only in gathering of alms, but also in bringing them to the hands of the poor Jews. The first of these brethren was Titus for whose care and willingness of mind for the perfecting of this business he praises God. Verse 18, And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches. Verse 19, And not that only, but who was also chosen of the churches to travel with us with this grace which is administered by us to the glory of the same God and declaration of your ready mind. His second messenger is described that he laboured diligently for the promoting of the gospel whether it was Barnabas or any other, it matters not. For whosoever he was, he is designed of the churches, called together, as it seems in a synodical way, as a person worthy of trust, to whom this business might be committed. Glory. Argument 12. Because this alms is taken into my care and administered by me and others to the glory of God, and demonstration of the willingness of your mind. Verse 20. Avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us. Verse 21. Providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but in the sight of men. He gives the reason why he had joined to himself those companions, of such approved fidelity in this administration of beneficence, collected for the use of the church of Jerusalem, viz., that he might take away the occasion of ill report from his adversaries, who might otherwise calumniate him, as if he had diminished somewhat of the money collected, and that he might consult his reputation with all men, as he had looked to his conscience before God, that he might be kept in the holy purpose of his integrity in this business. Verse 22, And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. He commends his third messenger, whether he were Luke or any other, it matters not, but from hence the force of the eleventh argument appears, whilst he says that he hath sent them out of his confidence of the Corinthians' liberality, such famous men that he doth not fear that their expectation will be frustrated, from whence it follows that he ought to contribute liberally. Verse 23. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. After he hath set forth each of these messengers with his own commendation, he commends them all together, and especially Titus, because they are the apostles of the churches, i.e. assigned by the churches for the gathering of his alms, and secondly, because they are the glory of Christ, so called, because his grace did gloriously shine in them, and by them his glory was illustrated. Verse 24. Wherefore show ye to them, and before the churches, the proof of your love, and of our boasting on your behalf. The exhortation being repeated, he adds, argument 13, This liberality, as it shall be a proof of our charity, so also it shall be the confirmation of my glorying of you, no wise vainly, in the sight of those that were assigned, who in the name of the churches being present will behold your liberality in this business. Therefore ye ought to contribute liberally. End of chapter 8「The Second Epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, analytically expounded by David Dixon, translated by William Retchford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9. He goes forward to speak concerning the collection. There are two parts of the chapter. In the first he giveth the reasons why he sent to them three brethren assigned, where he interposeth some arguments to persuade them to hasten the collection, to verse 6. In the other... He adds more arguments to move them to give liberally, as it becomes saints. Verse 1. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. That which belongeth to the first part, lest they should ill interpret his sending of those messengers, as if he should cherish a suspicion of their willingness in this business, he showeth that the cause of sending his brethren was not that they should be instructed, 
neither that they should be made willing to make a collection, because for that it would have been needless to have written, at least wise to have sent his brethren to them. Thus too, for I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Archaea was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. He confirms his words with three reasons. I know, reason one, because he had very well known their willingness of mind before. I boast, reason two, because he boasted of their readiness. Zeal, reason three, because their endeavour in this business had provoked many to the like alacrity and zeal. Verse three, yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that, as I said, ye may be ready. He propounds five true reasons why he sent the brethren. Reason one, that they would prepare for the more speedy conveying of their beneficence, and that now the money gathered might be found by the messengers as the apostle had promised in their name. Lest our rejoicing, reason two, lest the boasting of the apostle concerning them should be found in vain. Verse four, lest haply, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not you, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Reason three, following from the former, lest both you and I should be ashamed, if you should be found unprepared, when I, together with the Macedonians, who have heard me glorying in your behalf, should come unto you. Verse 5. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you, and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof ye had noticed before, that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty, not of covetousness. Reason 4. I have sent unto you the brethren, that you may be assisted in your gathering the money by the brethren, whereby all things may be more ready. Not as of covetousness. Reason 5. I have sent unto you the brethren, who have taken care lest any one in gathering should be urged to contribute more than he was willing, and lest covetousness in those that collect, or parsimony in those that contribute, should appear, but that they which give may give liberally and freely, and so the whole collection being liberal may appear at my coming as a blessing. The second part. Verse 6. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. The second part of the chapter follows, wherein he adds ten arguments that they would give their alms liberally, and as it becomes saints. Argument one, because whosoever shall give, either nothing or not according to his ability, or not out of the purpose of his heart, which is to sow sparingly, they shall reap also sparingly, i.e. shall get either nothing or only a temporal reward, therefore give ye liberally. Liberally, argument too, because they which will give liberally and out of love, which is to sow liberally, shall have a liberal harvest, therefore give ye liberally. Verse 7. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. After he hath expounded what it is to give liberally, or to sow in blessings, to it to give out of purpose of heart, not out of sadness or out of necessity, for he which so giveth, giveth sparingly, whatsoever he giveth, and would give nothing, if he might follow the purpose of his mind. He adds argument three, God loves a cheerful giver, and consequently a sad and unwilling giver, he neither loveth, nor approveth of, nor blesseth, therefore give ye liberally and cheerfully. Verse eight, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Argument 4 is tacitly propounded in the solution of an objection. So far be it from you, says he, that you fear want. If you contribute more plentifully, that on the other side you may rather expect that God will give you of his grace and power enough of temporal things, that not only you may be contented with your condition, but also that he might abound in every good work for the helping of others. Therefore give liberally. Verse 9, as it is written, He hath dispersed abroad, he hath given to the poor, his righteousness remains for ever. He confirms this argument out of Psalm 112, verse 9, where it is spoken that the righteous distributeth his goods, and giveth to the poor, and his righteousness remaineth for ever, where argument 5 is insinuated, that it is the property of the righteous man to distribute his goods, and to give to the poor, and that the ordinary blessing of God is upon them, that he may have further to bestow, therefore show yourselves righteous by giving liberally. Verse 10. Now he that ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown, and increase the fruit of your righteousness. 
argument six included in a wish and a similitude as god both ministereth seed to the husbandman after sowing and bread after harvest so ye shall both minister fruit out of your sowing i wish that ye might both increase your abilities for doing good and for the bringing forth fruits of righteousness and mercy therefore do not you doubt to sow in the giving of this alms verse eleven being enriched in everything to all bountifulness which causeth through us thanksgiving to god argument seven ye being enriched by the grace of god and abounding in all liberality may cause that through us who observe your charity thanks may be given to god therefore upon this account give ye liberally verse twelve for the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints but is abundant also by thanksgiving unto god he confirms this argument from this that the office of this undertaken ministry concerning the gathering and contributing this alms will not only supply the necessities of the saints in judea but will also cause by many saints that thanks be given unto god verse thirteen whilst by the experiment of this ministration they glorify god for your professed subjection unto the gospel of christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men argument eight this your liberality will be a sign of your faith and subjection of your obedient mind unto christ and his gospel as also a matter of glorifying god and lastly a sign of your liberality towards all that are poor when occasion is given therefore give ye liberally verse fourteen and by their prayer for you which long after you for the exceeding grace of god in you argument nine the saints in judea cherished by your liberality will pray to god for you therefore ye ought to give liberally long after you argument ten this your liberality will stir up in the holy jews love towards you and will cherish a desire of seeing you and will enkindle in them no small esteem of you by reason of that eminent grace of god in you be ye not wanting therefore in this verse fifteen thanks be unto god for his unspeakable gift as now having his desire and beholding the manifold fruit of their liberality which by the grace of god it would produce upon their refreshing the brethren in judea he thanks god for his gift in the liberality of the corinthians which he could not sufficiently in words declare as it deserved End of chapter 9chapter ten of the second epistle of paul to the corinthians analytically expounded by david dixon translated by william retchford this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten the third part of the epistle in which the apostle vindicates his authority from the aspersions of the false apostles whereby they laboured to lessen his authority with the corinthians in this chapter because they blamed paul that being present among the corinthians he carried himself humbly but being absent he had boasted of the weightiness of his authority in his letters he removes this calumny by defending the fact there are two parts of the chapter in the first he proves by eight arguments that he is not to be contemned to verse twelve in the second he modestly compares himself with those that were his emulators to the end verse one now i paul myself beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of christ who in presence am base among you but being absent am bold towards you argument one is contained in his obstetation by the meekness and gentleness of christ that they would not interpret his carriage otherwise than was meet as if he had said my humility was the self-same gentleness and the very imitation of the meekness of christ which i remember of you that ye acknowledging the imitation of our lord in me may judge rightly concerning me therefore i am not to be despised by you verse two but i beseech you that i may not be bold when i am present with that confidence wherewith i think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh ye ought to be ware lest by your fault i am compelled to exercise my power more boldly towards some of you when i come as i have determined to exercise against those who being led by fear or hope think of us as if we would change our carriage like carnal and irregenerate men therefore i am not to be despised verse three for though we walk in the flesh we do not war after the flesh argument two although i do not live free from human infirmity in this frail flesh yet in the execution of my office and my ministerial warfare i have not followed carnal lusts being led by fear or affection as they falsely lay to my charge when sometimes i carried myself humbly sometimes according to the dignity of my office and authority therefore i am not to be contemned verse four for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through god to the pulling down of strongholds argument four confirming the former 
I have no need to use carnal weapons in the subtle changing of my carriage, sometimes flattering, sometimes boasting, or using any other such like evil arts. But my spiritual weapons, such as they are, were sufficient in the truth, boldness in the exercising of ecclesiastical discipline, zeal, patience, Christian fortitude, and other virtues, wherewith being armed I do manage my warfare. Therefore I am not to be contemned. He shows a threefold virtue of these weapons. First virtue is that by divine power they are sufficient for the throwing down of all the strongholds of human wisdom, and the demolishing of subtle pretenses and all counsels with which carnal men striving against the gospel for their errors and vices use to defend themselves. Thus five, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The second virtue, he also reaches that these weapons are mighty as to the throwing down the pride of man's mind and the highness of worldly knowledge, so also to the converting or subduing high wits to the obedience and humble submission of themselves as captives to Christ by faith, understand it concerning the elect and those who are ordained to salvation. Verse 6. And having a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. The third virtue those weapons of the word of God and ecclesiastical censures are sufficient, etc., to revenge those that rebel and are disobedient as doing ready execution, partly in this life, partly in that which is to come, which weapons the apostle was making ready against his adversaries after he had recalled the flock of the Corinthians seduced from him into order and obedience, for he intended prudently to exercise the ecclesiastical censures. Verse 7. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? If any man trust to himself that he is Christ's, let him of himself think this again, that as he is Christ's, even so are we Christ's. Argument 5. Whereby he proveth that he ought not to be condemned, because judgment ought not to be made concerning the apostle's dignity by the external appearance of humility, for the interrogation hath the force of a negative duty, and is as much as ye ought not. If any man, argument 6, my humility nothing detracteth from the dignity of my ministry, but I am to be equalled with any one of those emulators, and am as near to Christ in as many respects as any of them, therefore I am not to be despised. Verse 8, for though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification, and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed. Argument 7, because, however, sometimes humbly, sometimes according to my authority, I shall carry myself, yet I can glory of my apostolical authority without vanity. In the meanwhile, lest the remembrance of his power should be troublesome, he says that this authority was given to him that he might be advantageous for their salvation, but not that by any means he should hinder their salvation. Verse 9, that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. Verse 10, for his letters, say they, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Verse 11, that such a one think this, that such as we are in word, by letters when we are absent, such will we be also in deed, when we are present. Argument 8. Lest I should seem to affect by my epistles that authority which I have not. Verse 9. As my accusers are diligent to intimate by their reproaches. Verse 10. I shall demonstrate that my authority is the same indeed when I come to them, which I used to show in my letters. Therefore do not ye contemn me. The second part, verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves and comparing themselves amongst themselves are not wise. The second part of the chapter follows, wherein he discovereth the vanity of those that praise themselves, who did so exalt themselves as if the apostle does not equal himself with them. The apostle compares himself with these in a fivefold dissimilitude. First, we humbly and modestly carrying ourselves, Surely we are not like them who ambitiously and boastingly insult over us, as if we were not to be compared with them, commending themselves above that which the thing itself doth admit them to be commended. Are not. Second, they show their own foolishness, measuring themselves by their own esteem, making themselves great in their own judgment, and of some like unto themselves. We avoid this vanity. Verse 13, But we will not boast of things without measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. Verse 14, For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reached not unto you, for we are come as far as to you also in preaching the gospel of Christ. Third, We do not boast beyond the measure and rule of our gifts and calling, as if we were sent to preach to those 
whom we are not sent to, but we keep ourselves within the measure of our apostolical calling assigned to us by God, which allows our preaching to you Corinthians, who by our means were converted to the faith. Our emulators do not so contain themselves, but run to those to whom they are not sent, and to boast above the measure of gifts and divine benediction upon their labours. Verse 15. Not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labours, but having hope, when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you according to our rule abundantly. Verse 16. To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, and not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. Fourth. We do not boast in the labours of others, as if we had converted to the faith those which we had not converted, as our emulators who boast in you, Corinthians, which they have not converted. But we hope that, after you are further established in the faith, that you may be confident, and also endeavour to propagate our gospel, and deal with your neighbours, that they may hear my preaching, for verily I hope that the borders of our ministry through you will be more abundantly enlarged, and that, according to the rule of my calling, to whom the apostleship to the Gentiles is committed. I hope, I say, it will come to pass, that we may preach the gospel also in those regions which are beyond us, that I shall not need to boast in another man's harvest, prepared by the labours of other men, as the false apostles now do, boasting in you, whom I have converted to salvation, not they. Verse 17. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Fifth. This he propoundeth by way of precept, I, an apostle, will boast only in the Lord, and not in evil things, not in feigned or false, nor in the gifts of God as mine, not in myself, as my emulators do boast in themselves, but as the Lord will allow me in God alone. Verse 18. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. He gives the reason of this, because no man is approved that commends himself out of his own opinion, but he that is approved of God, and receiveth testimony from him. The trial of this rule the emulators of the apostle could not abide. End of chapter 10。Chapter 11 of the Second Epistle of Paul to the there are two parts of the chapter. In the first, he gives an account of his boasting, reprehending the Corinthians, way being made for his future boasting, by the way drawing off the facade from the false apostles, to verse 21. In the other, he openeth the large matter of his boasting against those, his emulators, to the end. Verse 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. That which belongeth to the first, although he had not determined to boast, unless wholly and purely in the Lord, yet because at the first sight the praising of himself had the appearance of folly, therefore he wisheth and asketh that they would a little bear with him as foolish, speaking by way of concession, otherwise in very deed the Holy Ghost did speak in the Apostle, that he might better discover to them in this the reasons of his prudence, for because he saw them deceived by some vain and subtle men, not without the subtlety of Satan, he was compelled for their good to this boasting. Verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. He produceth ten reasons whereby he demonstrates the necessity of his boasting. Reason 1. Because I am driven with an holy zeal in the cause of Christ in this boasting. Therefore, boasting is necessary. He clears this reason because as a paranymph he did endeavour to marry the Corinthians not to himself but to Christ, as a chaste virgin, and to retain them in his society. Verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Reason 2. I fear, lest as Eve was seduced by the subtlety of the devil, so you, being corrupted by the false apostles, should be moved from that virgin-like simplicity of the gospel of Christ for the wisdom of God, embracing human wisdom and admitting the leaven of legal ceremonies to the corrupting the doctrine of the gospel of grace amongst you. Therefore this my boasting is necessary. Verse 4. For if he that cometh preaching another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Reason 3. Ye might deservedly bear with another thrasonical preacher. 
if he could impart unto you another Christ, which is impossible, or more excellent gifts of the Spirit, or a better gospel than you have accepted and received by our ministry. Truly, seeing that is impossible, ye ought deservedly to bear with me an apostle boasting, by whose preaching ye are made partakers both of the gifts of Christ and his Spirit. Verse 5. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. Reason 4. Confirming the former, I suppose they will not deny me to be inferior to Peter, James, and John, those apostles who were chiefly esteemed, because the gospel being communicated with them, Galatians 2, they have contributed nothing to me. Therefore my boasting against the false apostles is necessary and just. Verse 6. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Reason 5 because I will not contend with those that commend themselves for their excellency of speech or eloquence, but I will give place to none in the knowledge of the mysteries of salvation, which things he calls the Corinthians themselves to witness, who have very well understood his knowledge. Verse 7. Have I committed an offence in abasing myself, that you might be exalted, because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? Reason 6. Wherein he meets with an objection. Some would say, Whilst thou wert present at Corinth, Thou didst live by thy handicraft labour. Answer, my humility is so far from being blameworthy that it is rather worthy of praise, because it conduceth to your profit, whose salvation I did so much esteem, that, not regarding my profit, I preached the gospel to you of good will. Therefore, even for this cause, it is lawful for me to boast. Verse 8. I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. Verse 9. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man, for that which was lacking to me, the brethren, which came to Macedonia, supplied, and in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so will keep myself. He more clearly explains his practice by a pleasant metaphor, showing that he did take wages, even as spoils, from the other poorer churches, conquered by the gospel, to support himself, that he might better do service to the Corinthians freely. Verse 8 by name from the Macedonian Philippians, lest he should be chargeable to the Corinthians. Verse 10. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Archaea. Verse 11. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. Verse 12. But what I do, that I will do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. Lest he should seem to repent of what he had done, he determined that he will not afterwards be chargeable to them, or will not receive wages, which he confirms with an oath, verse 10, and lest they should take it ill, as if it was for want of love, that he would not receive wages of them, he professes that he had thus determined out of special love to them, calling God to witness concerning the truth of his words, verse 11, and that for this end, lest the false apostles should seem to exceed him in his boasting, from whom he would have the occasion of reproaching him, so taken away, who otherwise would say that Paul preached to the Corinthians for the increasing his substance. Verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Verse 15. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Reason 7. Showing the necessity of his boasting, because the wickedness of his emulators did compel him to this boasting, for they did feign themselves the apostles of Christ and workers in the vineyard of God, when, in the meanwhile, they only cared for their own business, not God's. They preached the gospel for profit's sake, and their own honour. They feigned themselves ministers of Christ, when they did only personate stage players. Verse 13. Neither is it to be wondered at, seeing these deceivers were the apostles of Satan, imitating the devil, who sometimes puts on the form of some celestial angel, that under the pretense of zeal and piety he might beguile men, whose manners his emulators did follow, pretending the glory of Christ, when in the meanwhile they sacrificed all their labour to the belly, to their purse, to their honour, nothing solicitous what became of the apostles, what of the churches, so that they might obtain their desires. To whom, therefore, the apostle threatens eternal death according to their deserts. Verse 16. I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. Verse 17. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. Reason 8. Because they should find that it was wisely done, that he was necessitated to this boasting, which he desires them to take notice of, 
but if as yet for the present they could not perceive the just necessity and prudence of his boasting at least wise he desires that they would bear with him patiently a little as foolishly boasting until he could finish his speech and apology for sixteen yielding only but not affirming that he foolishly boasted or that it was unbeseeming him to godward for otherwise the apostle with the greatest wisdom of the spirit did most justly boast to the glory of god and the benefit of the church in this whole business verse eighteen seeing that many glory after the flesh i will glory also reason nine because the false apostles did falsely glory against him therefore he contends that it is an equal thing that he himself should truly boast in his own defence verse nineteen for ye suffer fools gladly seeing ye yourselves are wise reason ten wise men were wont to bear with those that seemed more foolish as you know by experience why should ye not therefore suffer me of necessity to boast although herein i may seem foolish to some amongst you verse twenty for ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage if a man devour you if a man take of you if a man exalt himself if a man smite you on the face reason eleven because ye suffer more harsh things as it appears than this foolishness of my glorying for one ye suffer those importunate men who bring you into bondage such were the false apostles who exercised their power over them dividing the church of corinth into factions and set up themselves captains and lords of their followers amongst the corinthians as of soldiers and servants two ye suffer those which devour you such were the false apostles affecting stately banquets and eating up the substance of the corinthians three ye suffer spoilers such also were the false apostles who would not indeed take wages but in the meantime they coveted gifts and did collogue and receive them from the corinthians for ye suffer those that contemn you such were the false apostles who because of the stock and hebrew nation which they were of and some gifts of the spirit given to them above the church of corinth gathered out of the illiterate and ignoble gentiles did above measure exalt themselves five ye suffer those that smite you on the face or those that use you reproachfully why therefore should ye not suffer this my just boasting verse twenty one i speak as concerning reproach as though we had been weak howbeit wherein soever any is bold i speak foolishly i am bold also he expounds what it is to smite on the face that it is not to be understood of external violence but in respect of reproach which in some measure he found amongst the corinthians from those false teachers when the false apostles hit the corinthians in the teeth with the lowness of their minds in that they subjected themselves to paul and handicraftsmen for what else was this but to smite the corinthians in the face and insult over the holy apostle the second part howbeit wherein soever the second part of the chapter follows in which the way already being prepared for him to a just glorying and the necessity of it being demonstrated he compares himself with those glorious doctors proving himself not inferior to them in four characters of his dignity but to be preferred before upon many accounts sign one of his dignity propounded in general that he was inferior to them in nothing whatsoever they looked upon in their glorying in the meanwhile he modestly grants a show of folly in this his glorying which yet he wisely prosecutes verse twenty two are they hebrews so am i are they israelites so am i the second sign of his dignity more specially laid down that he is worthy to be compared to them in the nobility of his lineage for if he had sought glory from a holy nation he sprung from that family which had not mixed themselves with the gentiles he was an hebrew from hebrew parents if he would glory in the nobility of his race he sprung from the more noble israelites because from the tribe of benjamin benjamin was the son of rachel a woman freeborn but some tribes had their original from bondmaids if they strived for the antiquity of religion that they remained in the covenant as true abrahamites here also he was equal to any one of them verse twenty three are they ministers of christ i speak as a fool i am more in labours more abundant in stripes above measure in prisons more frequent in deaths oft sign three if they had striven for the dignity of office herein modestly as one compelled he prefers himself before them in respect of his apostleship and office granted to him extraordinarily i am greater says he because i am an apostle in labours the fourth sign of his dignity his sincerity in the administration of his office of this his sincerity he produces nine testimonies first his labours or his diligence secondly his sufferings in general which belonged to his health and bodily liberty and the dangers of his life 
verse 24, of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thirdly, he produces his special sufferings for the Jews, that he was whipped by them five times according to the number of stripes inflicted upon malefactors by the law. For the Jews, although they are cruel, yet they would seem to contain themselves within the law, Deuteronomy 25, verse 3. Verse 25, Thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep. Fourthly, his sufferings from the Gentiles bear testimony that by their lictors or sergeants he was beaten thrice with clubs and whips and once stoned. Fifthly, that he thrice suffered shipwreck, in one whereof, after he was twenty-four hours tossed by the waters in the deep sea, he was freed by the powerful hand of God. Verse 26, in journeying often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren. The sixth testimony of his sincerity comprehends the labours of his journeying, and eight kinds of dangers, which he found in sundry places and from diverse kinds of men. Verse 27, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. The seventh have five sorts of troubles, with which, while he fulfilled the work of the ministry, he was very often exercised, wherein, being wearied, he was, instead of rest, forced to take in hand new labours. Verse 28. Besides those things which are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Eighthly, his unconquerable patience in daily public businesses, a solicitous mind for all the churches of Christ. Verse 29. Who is weak, and am I not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? The ninth testimony of his sincerity is his sympathy with all that are afflicted and offended by any scandal. Verse 30. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. He retorts the objection of his adversaries. But all these things have made thee a contemptible and miserable man. He answers that he purposely determined to glory in these as the things which did more commend his sincerity than the prosperous affairs of the false apostle adorned them. Verse 31, The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed for evermore, knoweth that I lie not. Verse 32, In Damascus the governor, and Aretas the king, kept the city with a garrison, desirous to apprehend me. Verse 33, And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall, and escaped his hands. Lastly, because these things, which he had mentioned, may seem incredible, viz. that one should be able to bear so many afflictions, premising an oath, touching the truth, as well of those things that were said already, as of those that were to be spoken, he mentions the special danger of his life, out of which there was no apparent escape, unless God had kept him safe for the good of the church, and opened a way by his special providence for his escape, concerning which, Acts 9, verse 23. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve》Twelve of the Second Epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, analytically expounded by David Dixon, translated by William Retchford. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve. He proceeds in his holy glorying. There are three parts of the chapter. In the first, he explains the heavenly vision presented to him, together with the events of the same. To verse eleven. In the second, he proves that the Corinthians ought to have freed him from this necessity of glorying or defending him. To verse 19. In the third, he produces the causes of his troubles. Verse 1. It is not expedient for me, doubtless, to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. The preface being premised, that he doth not glory for his own sake, because that was not expedient for him, for this is here somewhat emphatical, for me, but for the Corinthians, and the church's sake, whom it concerned, to preserve the authority of the apostle entire, he cometh to extraordinary revelations, one of which he begins historically to declare. Verse 2. I knew a man in Christ about fourteen years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such an one caught up to the third heaven. I knew a man. He discovers the excellency of this revelation, and his modesty, by nine arguments. Argument 1. That he scarcely dare publish his name in this business, but lest he may seem to arrogate much to himself, he is compelled to speak of himself in a third person in Christ. Argument 2. That although this revelation may seem to extol him above the common condition of men, yet he doth not affect any other excellence than to be in Christ, 
or in the number of believers who have renounced themselves, that they may glory in Christ alone. 14. Argument 3. That silently with himself he had suppressed the mention of this glorious revelation whole fourteen years, never intending to recite it, unless he was compelled by the importunity of his emulators, who endeavoured to diminish his apostolical authority to the damage of the gospel and the church. Caught up. Argument 4. That he was caught up to the upper heaven, above all the stars, to the place of the blessed spirits, where God chiefly manifests his glory, whether in the body. Argument 5 that he is ignorant whether he was caught up by the local translation of his body into heaven, or whether his soul extraordinarily was separated for that time, and lifted up into heaven, concerning the other notwithstanding, I am certain. Verse 3. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. Verse 4. He was caught up into paradise, and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Into paradise. Argument 6 that he certainly knew the matter done, and that he was caught up into paradise, or into that blessed seat of the glory of God, whereupon he repeats the second time, I know a man, and there heard ineffable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter, i.e., of whom something could not be expressed, other things it was not lawful for him to utter, which otherwise, had he not been prohibited, might have been uttered, for those things which were revealed, he is certain, did belong to his private confirmation, and preparations for those conflicts he was about to undergo, Verse 5. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but of my infirmities. Argument 7. That indeed he was ready to boast to the glory of God of such a man, i.e. of himself as the servant of God, exalted after this manner, but not concerning himself considered in himself, for that he had nothing in himself in which he might glory except his infirmities. Verse 6. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. Argument 8. That although he had sufficient matter of glorying offered upon this revelation, that truly and solidly without vanity he might much more glory, but he determined as yet sparingly to speak of this matter, lest he should stir up too much esteem of himself. For 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Argument 9. That the excellence of the revelation was so great, as that he might beware of pride, the angel of Satan was sent for the apostle's humiliation. A thorn. He describes the reason of his humbling so, that he intimates three reasons of it. Reason 1. That the matter of this humiliation was something of the relics of sin in his flesh, or his corrupt nature as yet not quite abolished, viz. some motion of concupiscence tending to his further sinning, which motion he compares to a thorn left in a lopped wood, because it was no less troublesome to him than a thorn was one to be fastened in the foot of a traveller. The messenger, reason too, of his humiliation, that this motion carried along with it a special temptation opening a way to the devil, making way to sin. To buffet, Reason 3. This temptation, sent from the devil, doth so much the more violently solicit him to sin, that he was compelled to implore divine assistance, lest he should be overcome with the temptation. Which exercise, as it is not to be wondered at by him that reads chapter 7 of Romans, so it is to be acknowledged the most efficacious means for the humbling of the apostle, for he that was wont to bear all troubles and fights, both with his bodily and spiritual enemies courageously, he is heard to howl and cry out in his combat with the flesh, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me, etc. Verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. The humiliation of the apostle itself follows, of which he brings four signs. Sign 1. That he had very often prayed unto God, that he would deliver him from the tempter. Verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Sign 2. That he rested in the answer of God, in which he certified him, partly of the sufficiency of his grace, for the sustaining of his combating servant, lest he should be overcome by the tempter, for the washing away of all pollution which he had contracted in his combat partly concerning the end of his purpose in the exercise of his servants, which is, that by how much any servant of God is found more weak in any combat, by so much the strength of God sustaining him might more clearly and perfectly demonstrate itself. 
most gladly. Sign three, that a more constant frame of humility would ensue upon this combat of his, wherein he determined to acknowledge his infirmities and weaknesses in all things, to this very end that he might experience the power of Christ dwelling in him, and so much the more apparently manifested. Verse 10. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Sign 4. That he had now learnt not only to bear all afflictions courageously for the gospel, which might make him more humble, but out of them to take much pleasure, because when he perceived himself most weak, flying to Christ, he had experience of his more powerful presence for the sustaining and comforting him, and likewise making him victorious. The second part, verse 11. I am becoming a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. The second part of the chapter contains his glorying in the manifestation of his apostleship, powerfully and sincerely administered among the Corinthians. He clears this glorying from that folly which some might object, laying the fold upon the Corinthians, from whose neglect the necessity of the apostle glorying did arise for they ought to assert his dignity against the false apostles. He says, I ought to be commended by you, or it was your part to defend me. He brings nine reasons of this proposition, and also of his glorying. For in nothing, reason one, because although the apostle was nothing in himself, yet by the grace of God he was not inferior to the chief apostles, the Corinthians being his witnesses, therefore he ought to be defended and commended by them. Verse 12, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Reason two, confirming the former, because amongst you the signs of my apostleship appear, partly in my patient enduring of labours, troubles, and injuries, partly in the effects and signs of my apostleship, in miracles and powerful works. Therefore I ought to be commended by you. Verse 13, For what is that wherein you are inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. Reason 3. Because the Corinthian church is endowed with such illustrious gifts of the Holy Ghost by my ministry, as any other church, founded either by other apostles or by myself, therefore my ministry ought to be defended by you. Except it be that. Reason 4. Because his zeal in propagating the gospel amongst them was so great that he preached the gospel to the Corinthians freely, wherein, if there was any wrong, by a civil irony he asks pardon, intimating the benefit which was vouchsafed to them, therefore he ought to be defended by them. Verse 14. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours but you, for the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. Reason 5. Confirming the former, because the apostle was still of the same mind towards them, not to take any wages of them for the future, when he shall come to them, for now he prepared himself for coming the third time, although his second intention to come was hindered, as it is to Corinthians 1. Yours, reason 6, confirming the former, because he sought the salvation of the Corinthians, and not to convert their goods to his own proper use, therefore they ought to defend him. For I seek not, reason 7, because although he be their spiritual father, who ought to be nourished by his folk or his children, yet he endeavoured to intimate natural parents who ordinarily lay up for their children, Otherwise, if the parents be in want, it is not to be doubted but children ought to do their mutual duties to their parents, and to honour them by nourishing them. Verse 15. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be beloved. Reason 8. Because he was ready to spend his goods and life itself for their salvation, which vehement love he amplifies from the ingratitude of the Corinthians, who in the meanwhile did not make return of his love, but received the false apostles, his emulators, and made more of them than the apostle himself, their father. Verse 16. But be it so, I did not burden you, nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. Verse 17. Did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? Verse 18. I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? Reason 9, in which he prevents an objection. Some might say, although thou thyself hast not received of them wages, yet perhaps thou hast drawn much from them by those whom thou hast sent. He answers that his companions and ambassadors, which he had sent to the Corinthians, have taken the same care, lest they should burden the Corinthians. 
but by the way he checks his adversaries whilst he clears himself from those arts which those crafty workmen did use who when they would seem to receive nothing themselves did suborn others who should receive for their use whatsoever they could squeeze from the corinthians therefore the corinthians ought to defend paul and stop the mouths of his accusers in his absence the third part verse nineteen again think you that we excuse ourselves unto you we speak before god in christ but we do all things dearly beloved for your edifying the third part of the chapter follows wherein by preventing an objection he gives the reasons of his defence some might say wherefore dost thou write these things wherefore is that defence whether art thou conscious of some evil or dost thou desire to be extolled by us he answers by giving five reasons why he was so solicitous in that kind one i have not writ these to this intent that as guilty of some evil or that i desired glory i may clear myself amongst you or excuse myself but out of my love to you that i might promote your edification and salvation lest you viz thinking meanly of my apostleship should by the false apostles be moved from the simplicity of the gospel for the testimony of this my assertion i call god who hath known my mind and christ whose business i do to be my witnesses verse twenty for i fear lest when i come i shall not find you such as i would and that i shall be found unto you such as ye would not lest there be debates envyings wrath strifes backbitings whisperings swellings tumults reason two i fear lest my authority and doctrine being diminished amongst you through the false apostles when i come i shall find you such as i would not i e infected with those evils which follow upon schisms such are strifes or contentions emulations or envy concerning the gifts of god wraths or angers from mutual injuries brawlings or mutual provocations backbitings and whisperings by which openly and privily men are wont to defame one another swellings and as it were puffings up of the mind out of pride and lastly tumultuous seditions and that i reason three i fear lest ye should find me more severe than you would unless ye timely mend by admonitions and submit to my doctrine and authority in the lord verse twenty one and lest when i come again my god will humble me amongst you that i shall bewail many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed reason four i fear lest if my authority be despised amongst you many amongst you will impenitently continue in their defilement fornications and such like sins which i have in the former epistle reproved will humble me reason five i fear lest the lord should afflict me when i come to you viz lest your sins should create shame sadness and mourning to me and offences amongst you who are my glory and joy if you behave yourselves as it becometh children but you will cause shame and sadness to me if you do otherwise that he might prevent these evils and take away scandals arising amongst them it was necessary that the authority of the apostle and apostolical doctrine should be maintained amongst them for this end this the apostle's apology was necessary end of chapter twelve chapter fifteen of the second epistle of paul to the corinthians analytically expounded by david dixon translated by william retchford this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen in this last chapter he proceeds to vindicate his apostolical authority from contempt and to make it awful and amiable amongst them the proposition to be confirmed is this my authority ought to be reverenced by you the arguments which confirm this thesis are ten verse one this is the third time i am coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established argument one i forewarn you by that authority committed unto me of the purpose of my coming unto you now the third time that you being twice or thrice forewarned concerning my coming it might be instead of two or three witnesses to certify you of my firm purpose to exercise ecclesiastical censure amongst you therefore my authority is to be feared by you verse two i told you before and foretell you as if i was present the second time and being absent now i write to them which heretofore have sinned and to all other that if i come again i will not spare argument two from the combination of exercising severity when he came upon the impenitent who had first sinned and not repented be persuaded that i will severely punish the impenitent when i come therefore fear ye and repent verse three since ye seek a proof of christ speaking in me which to you would is not weak but is mighty in you he gives the reasons of this his severe combination 
because they tempted Christ and the Apostle, doubting whether Christ spake in the Apostle, or the Apostle from the authority of Christ. And also he adds, argument three, for the vindicating of his authority, Christ hath powerfully manifested himself amongst you by my ministry, partly by grace given to sinners, partly by the gifts of the Spirit conferred upon the presbyters and others, partly by miracles done amongst you, partly by the correcting of stubborn sinners. Fear, therefore. Verse four, for though he was crucified through weakness, yet he lived by the power of God, for we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God towards you. Argument 4. That as Christ was crucified in the infirmity of the flesh, but is found alive by the Spirit and power of his deity, so I am weak in appearance, and have carried myself humbly for Christ's sake, that I might be conformable to Christ. But by the power of God I have been able, and shall be also powerful in my ministry, when the matter requires it. Therefore my authority is to be feared. Verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Argument 5. All you, after your examination, shall know that Christ dwells in you, through my ministry, unless some of you are castaways and unworthy of the name of believers, or at least as yet unregenerate. Therefore the authority of my apostleship ought to be reverenced by you. For 6. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobates. Argument 6. Whatsoever ye now are, I hope it will come to pass that at length, ye being overcome by the truth, and convicted by the signs of my apostleship, may acknowledge me to be the true servant of Christ, and not a false or a reprobate apostle, therefore my authority ought to be reverenced by you. Verse 7. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that ye should do that which is honest, though we be as reprobates. Argument 7 by which he doth not only vindicate his authority from contempt, but by the moderation of his mind maketh it lovely. I earnestly desire you to abstain from all evil and do good, lest I should need to exercise my authority amongst you. And to this end I pray God that I may not regard my reputation, whether approved or disapproved by the judgment of men, I am indifferent, so that it may be well with you. Therefore my authority ought to be reverenced by you. Verse 8. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. Argument 8. Confirming the former, my authority doth not prevail against truth or righteousness, that they may be destroyed, but for preserving the truth, and therefore, if you do no evil, my authority amongst you will cease, therefore that ought to be beloved by you. Verse 9. For we are glad when we are weak, and ye are strong, and this also we wish even your perfection. Argument 9. Confirming the seventh. I rejoice when there is no occasion for the exercise of my authority, as if I had none. Do not show my power, having nothing more in my desires than your integrity, that all things, being duly composed, and the members of the church, which are now disjointed, being restored, I may never have need to extol myself to your terror. Therefore my authority ought both to be reverenced and loved by you. Verse 10. Therefore I write these things, being absent, lest being present I should use sharpness, according to the power which the Lord hath given me to edification, and not to destruction. Argument 10. Now I deal with you more severely by letters, that you may repent, lest, being present, I be compelled more severely to punish the impenitent, according to my power given me for your good, but not for your hurt. Therefore my authority ought to be reverenced by you. Verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Verse 12. Greet one another with an holy kiss. Verse 13. All the saints salute you. Verse 14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. He concludes the epistle with a very fit exhortation which is sixfold. Exhortation 1. That they may rejoice in obeying my admonitions with real joy. 2. That they may be perfect or sound and schism being laid aside may be joined together amongst themselves. 3. That they may have comfort by obeying him. 4. That in opinions they may agree amongst themselves. 5. That joined in affections they follow peace. Which exhortations he confirms by promising the divine presence in the fuller gifts of his grace, which God, who delights in peace and love, is wont to give to those that endeavour after peace and love. Greet. 6. He exhorts that they would show towards one another the signs of mutual love without dissimulation, as it becometh saints. The grace of our Lord... After his salutation in the name of the saints, 
In the end he applies himself to them by an apostolical benediction, and wishes for them more that there might not only be granted a right to all the comfortable benefits of Christ, but also an acknowledgment, a sense, and more full fruition, first of the grace of reconciliation made by Christ, further of his divine love, which by Christ descends upon us, and thirdly all sorts of gifts of the Holy Ghost, sealing, even as with his seal, his desire and hope. Amen. End of chapter 13. End of the second epistle of Paul to the Corinthians, analytically expounded by David Dixon.